Okay, Sam Parker, it's time to worship, buddy. I'm on, uh, this is unofficial announcements, okay? It's official but unofficial. This is not the start of the service. Next Sunday morning is Men's Day. Men will be in charge of the service. Men, we're going to have a men's choir. Men, I expect to see you in the men's choir next Sunday morning, okay? Just men only. We're going to meet in the choir room as soon as Sunday school is over. So if you go to Sunday school, you get out of that class and come on. If you don't come to Sunday school, shame on you and come on anyway, okay? But I know you're sitting out there and saying, I've just been wondering, when am I going to get to sing? <laughs> All these years, next Sunday morning is your chance. We're not going to do the Halloween course this week, maybe next week too. Come on, be something you know simple. Come on, meet us in the choir next week, okay? Nikki? Good morning out there. Oh. Anybody hear me? Uh, good morning. morning. I know y'all can do better than that. It's good to see y'all this morning. It's good to see some um, familiar faces and some new ones. So welcome all of you visitors. And visitors, we would love for you to fill out the flappy sheet of paper, as we call it here, in the bulletin. You rip it out and put it in the offering plate in a few minutes. But first, we're going to have a pop quiz on uh, what was in the, our bulletin last week. So, hope that you read over it. All right, here's your question. What were the names? Now, um, the family's not allowed to answer this question, okay? Because you would be cheating, kind of. Um, Bunk and Nancy, they had some great-granddaughters. What were their names? Twins, what were their names? Did anybody read that? Madison's one. And Natalie, very good choir. Good job. All right, make sure to read those bulletins. Okay, open them up real quick. I'm going to highlight a few things. And there are some things that aren't in the bulletin, so listen up. Um, let me just do these here. Right after their service this morning, the worship committee will meet with Mike. Worship committee right after the service this morning. And then next Sunday morning, there is a new Sunday school class starting up. And it's for you young adults, married or single. Um, and you will be meeting in the room across from the college and career. And if that makes no sense to you, let me explain. If you go up the stairs to the second floor, you will take a left. And then it's the room on the right. Left, right. Left, right. Okay? So please come and Mary and uh, Randy will be teaching that class. So that'll be fun. Have a great teacher. Um, all right. Tonight, we have our evening worship. It's going to be a really special worship service. So please come back tonight at 6 o'clock. A lot of stuff going on. Then afterwards, we will have a new member fellowship reception. And our new members are Holly and Thomas. So bring some goodies to snack on, some drinks and stuff, and we will celebrate that together afterwards. Um, and next Sunday night, we have our game night, our volleyball night. And remember, if you don't like to play volleyball, just come. If you've got some cards, bring some cards or dominoes, whatever, or just come and talk and chit-chat with everybody. Um, but that's, that'll be next Sunday night. And then also Wednesday night, we have supper. Before our uh, evening worship, it will be at 545. And the menu is in the bulletin. So if any of you are interested in that and are not signed up, please call the office by in the morning. Get your name on that list to eat. And then we'll have service at 630 that night. All right. And remember, read over this bulletin. Good stuff in here. All right. So now let's stand and get some hugs, shake hands, say good morning.
and just as Moses lifted up the serpent from the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have ever eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe in him are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And in his judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because of their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light. So their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do come, their deeds... Oh, lost my place. But those who do, <laughs> those who do come to the light say that it may be cl certainly clear that their deeds have been done by God. Well, good morning again. First hymn this morning, 299. Hymn number 299, Rescue the Perishing. I ask you to stand with us, please. First, second, last night. of Tyson Foods, Inc. includes 104,000 team members working in 252 facilities in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Alan Tyson, Director of Chaplain Services for Tyson Foods, works with 125 part-time chaplains to pr provide a proactive ministry of presence and availability to multi-faith and multicultural workforce. Pray for Alan and the chaplaincy team as they provide pastoral care, counseling, and visitation. Pray also that they might bring hope and the good news of God's love and grace to the workplace. Please bow your heads for a moment of silent prayer. Amen.
The offertory hymn for the morning, hymn number 473. 473, Victory in Jesus. We'll sing all three stanzas. You join with us, please, as we sing.
Today our scripture will come from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament in chapter 21. Before I turn there, I wanted to uh, say how glad I am that Wendell is back in the house in worship. Glad you're doing better. Good to see you. Glad to have you back, brother. And we continue to pray for you, complete your recovery. I know you still got some soreness, but... We're happy that the doctors found what they needed to find and did what they needed to do. And the Lord was with you during that time. Good to go. That's great. Uh, Also, last night, one of our members was recognized. Pleasant Valley has a Hall of Fame 
sort of a community hall of fame, people who've contributed and helped out at the school over the years. And last night, uh, E.L. Green was given that honor. He's probably hiding somewhere back in the back. I think he is. We're very proud of E.L. Y'all tell him, pat him on the back when you go. Uh, I also want you to know, and I was at the school and, and saw this, and I think I have everybody, and I may miss some, I hope I don't, but Lamar Freeman, you had that honor at one time, there's a picture there, Wallace Amaro, Steve Green, is there anybody else? That's pretty good from our church, I think there's about eight, eight pictures up there of people in the last seven or eight years, so I'm really proud of that, please pat him on the back and those others I mentioned, and we appreciate so much all the work that you do. You were rightly honored by helping out our school and our community. Uh, finally, I want to let you know about tonight. We, we have worship services on Sunday night, and uh, we decided some time back in our vision team that we wanted to emphasize the core values of our church. And so we're going to build worship services around each of our 12 core values, and tonight is our first service celebrating our, our first core value, which is our value of our relationship to Jesus Christ. So we're going to have an opportunity to reflect on who Jesus is to us and what it means to us to be a Christian. I think it'll be a very meaningful service for all of us, so I hope that you'll come and be a part of that at 6 o'clock tonight as we begin our worship around our first core value, our relationship to Jesus. And we're going to look today in chapter 21 of Numbers. Uh, Jesus gave us the wonderful John 3.16 that we all love, and uh, you read that for us this morning, Jake. Uh, the verses before that is an allusion to the time that a bronze serpent was put on a pole and lifted up in the desert. And this is that story in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, beginning in verse 4. From Mount Or they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of the Egypt to die in the wilderness, they said. For there's no food here and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and they would live. This is God's word for us this morning.
I know I'm going to repeat, repeat myself because it happens so often, but the music was great today, wasn't it? Uh, and everybody's singing. Although I will admit one of the things that's, that is uh, fearful for me is that one day, while I'm thinking about the sermon pretty much all the time, and while we're singing, Roy's going to say, now all the women, you sing verse 2, and I'm going to be singing. So if that ever happens, just forgive me, okay? I know who I am. Flying, intimacy, the dark, death, spiders, driving, love, God, success, being alone. It's a top ten list. What are those things about? Fear. If you saw the title of the sermon, it might have helped. The snakes weren't on there, but they might be on my top ten list. What do you fear the most? It's a lot of things to be scared of in the world where we live, isn't there? It's a lot of things for us to fear. Many of us fear growing older, aging. Uh, we fear relationships. We fear the economy. We fear diseases that may come our way. There's a guy that I read about who is in the jungle in the same country where they believe that HIV made the jump from animals into humans. Uh, sometime in the early 1900s is when that happened, and it took a while, obviously, for it to spread uh, into the AIDS epidemic that we face today. He's working now in the jungles of Africa in that same area to study bush hunters and to see what is the next virus that may be ready to jump from animals to humans. That's a little scary to me. I don't know about you. What will be next? The future is one of the things that's scary, especially as we raise children and wonder what it will hold for them. Uh, Garrison Keillor uh, tells a story of a daddy who had a hard time, I think, had a fear of expressing his emotions to his sons. He coached a baseball team, here are my glasses, he coached a baseball team in Lake Wobegon, if you ever listen to the radio. The town club team was called the Lake Wobegon Schroeders, so named because the starting nine were brothers, sons of E.J. Schroeder. Uh, he never could tell his kids how proud he was of them. They were all pretty good ball players. Guy hit a good hit, he would say, blind man could have hit that one. Your grandma could have put the wood on that one. If a guy couldn't hit that one out, there'd be something wrong with him, I'd say. Wynn practically took that one out of here, don't even need to hit it much, and lean over and spit. And that'd be the daddy. One day, one of his sons in the ninth inning was playing center field, and the ball was hit deep and probably going out for a home run. And so he took his glove and threw it 40 feet into the air. The ball stuck in his glove. He caught both the glove and the ball. And he looked over to see his dad clapping. When his dad saw him, he pretended he was swatting mosquitoes. <laughs> and when the boy got back to the dugout, uh, he said, I saw a man in Superior, Wisconsin, do that a long time ago, but he did it at night, and the ball was hit a lot harder. <laughs> And I know it's hard sometimes to express our feelings. And sometimes we're afraid to, to open up and tell somebody what we really feel, isn't it? I would encourage you to remember <clears throat> that you have a limited amount of time to do some things. We have a lot of fears in this world. There was a quote from a guy who once said that the enemy of our souls loves to whisper fear in our ears. Now, the story that we have today is the story of the Hebrew people who were slaves in Egypt under the great power of the Egyptian Pharaoh, and they had, through the power of God and very special people like Moses and Aaron and Miriam, been led out in what we call the Exodus. And so they leave slavery. They get to experience the power of God through the ten plagues of Egypt, and then they get to see the, the parting of the Red Sea, and then they go out in the desert and they make a sort of a roundabout trip to a place they call the Promised Land. It's a very special place that they've been looking for and heard about all their lives. But through that, through that journey to get there, they complain. And they complain so much that God decides that they will have to spend 40 more years as punishment, 40 more years out in the desert wandering around until the complaining generation sort of passes on. Well, that begins to happen, and so now we flash forward to our time in the story that we've read today. These are the children of the complainers. 
And the children are once again led on the verge of going to that promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey that they've been dreaming about and thinking about all those years. And they begin to complain mightily against the Lord again. They complain about a lot of stuff. God in the desert knows that there's not a lot of food available, so he provides them with some special food called manna. Literally, what is it? That's probably like Frosted Flakes. So every morning you gather up all the Frosted Flakes you want, and that's what you get to eat. And they began to complain about that. And they said, you know, it tastes sweet, but we don't have any meat to go with it. And it sure would be nice to have a chicken in the pot every once in a while, wouldn't it? And then they just start complaining about the man itself and say, it's no good. We don't like that. We wish we didn't even have any of that kind of stuff. And then some begin to experience the, uh, the feeling that, you know, my parents talked about the hope of the promised land, but what about those old tales? I mean, that's sort of old-time religion, and I'm not sure that I need that old-time religion. Is that really true today? Because we're probably smarter than our parents were. And some would even go around and say, have you ever had a vision from God? Has God ever talked to you? Because God had never talked to me. So I'm sort of wondering, is this God stuff... And they begin to complain and complain and complain. And so they also experience the judgment of God in a vicious way by poisonous snakes that begin to infest their encampment. They will find snakes in their beds. They will find snakes in the cribs where their children sleep. They will find snakes when they open up the cooking pot. They will find snakes everywhere. And almost everybody gets bitten by these poisonous snakes. That's not good. And so they, they go to Moses with hat in hand, and tell God and tell Moses how sorry we are for complaining. We were wrong. We know that now. And we want you to go to God and tell him we were sorry and take these snakes away. And it's a strange tale of God instructing Moses to make a snake the symbol of their fear, the thing they fear the most, the poisonous snakes, to make that symbol something out of bronze and put it on a pole. And anybody who gets bitten by a snake, you still get bitten, but at least you can look at the snake on the pole and you won't die. Look up, he says. Anytime bad things happen to you like that and the things that scare you the most happen to you, I want you to lift your head and look up and it'll hurt some, but it'll also be okay. Look up. And so some do that. And that happens for them. A snake on a pole. It's a pretty strange story for the Bible, isn't it? The people loved that snake on the pole so much that they kept it with them for years and years. They kept it when they went into the promised land. They kept it when they uh, had Solomon build them the great temple of God. They kept it right near the ark. In fact, it wasn't until a, a boy king named Josiah wants to reform the worship and religion of his people that he says, you know, I've been noticing some folks are going and offering stuff to the snake on the pole. So they finally did away with the snake on the pole. Our medical industry uses the snake on the pole as a symbol of healing to this day. You've sort of seen that. It comes from this story. Look up at the thing that scares you the most, that God has taken and sort of reworked, and even though you'll get hurt, and even though you're still going to have fears, it's going to be okay and you'll live. And the folks who do choose to look up are saved. The folks who look up at some point in time will get to look up and see the Jordan River, which is the boundary between them and that promised land, part again for them. And they will get to walk over, the ones who looked up will walk over on a dry riverbed, and they will go into the land flowing with milk and honey. And they will begin to experience the blessing that God had for them. I think we can learn from this story of several things, but one that's very important for all of us to know is that probably everybody will get bitten in this life. And by that I mean there will be stuff that will scare you to death. There will be fears that come your way no matter how brave you are or how protected you feel you are. There will be bad things that will happen to all you good people. That's life, isn't it? Bad things happen, and scary things happen. And I don't think we can stop it. I and mean, we can try, and we ought to try, and we ought to try to protect ourselves and our children, but we can't stop it from happening. What we can choose is how we respond to the hurts and the fears that come to our lives. 
You know, one of the things that happened for the Israelites here is that they had won a big battle, finally. You know, they lost a lot. I don't know if you know that from that story. They were wandering around the desert all that time. You know, when they first got the promised land, they sent ten spies in to check it out, and they got a bad report, eight to two, against them. Eight of them said, we're like grasshoppers, and they're like giants, and there's no way we can handle this promised land. Only two said, we can do this with God's help, but they complained, and they were so scared that they turned away. For 40 years, they're in the desert. And they, they battle people, as ancient peoples did, traveling around. And they had, they had no luck, really. They just got beat almost all the time, and they had to move on. And right before this story, they win. And for some reason, that one victory, which was good for them, lifted their expectations. And so they started hearing Crocodile Dun get Dundee in their ear. Says, good day, mate. No worries. No worries. No troubles. And they began to think that now they were invincible. They began to think that now there would be no more worries for them. No troubles. Anywhere they went, with God by them, anything good would happen. Whatever happened to them was going to be okay. Everywhere they would go, they'd win a battle. It would be easy. There'd be no snakes. There'd be no hurts. There'd be no fears. There'd be no problems. And their false expectations made the story of the snakes even worse. You know, some place in the Bible says, and John says, that your heart condemns you much worse than I would ever think about doing, says God. You ever have that happen to you? Fears that you build up inside for yourself, and they become much greater than the actual thing that ever happens to you. And I think sometimes that's true. The people who chose to look down and try to tear the snakes off themselves, they didn't fare too well. God asked them to make a faith choice, and the faith choice was to quit looking down at your fears and troubles, even though it's very tempting to do that, but to raise your head and look up and see the salvation that God would give to you. And those who looked up were saved. Now, I'm not telling you that it's right to say that I'm going to always be okay because I'm a Christian and I'm a good person and I'm going to be all right and nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. It's not right to say that. That's sort of false expectations. That's Crocodile Dundee in my ear and that's not always right. There are worries and there are troubles and there are fears and there are hurts that come our way in this life. Everybody's going to get bitten, but it's equally wrong to just sort of look down all the time at your fears and your troubles and your hurts and your pains and I think that the longer you look down, the bigger those troubles tend to get. The more you look down at your own struggles, which everybody has, and yours is different than mine, but we all have them, the more we look at struggles and pains and fears, the greater those things become to us. And by focusing so much attention on them, we empower them to become monsters that they were never intended to be for us. And God simply says, look up. Now, I want to say to you that sometimes you won't be able to do that. You'll be so downtrodden, so fearful, so hurt, so, so weak, that you're not going to be able to do that. And you will need help to do that. That's one of the reasons we come to church, we come to Sunday school, we come together with Christians, we have families that support us. Sometimes somebody has got to lift my head up and allow me to look up because I don't have the strength or the energy or even the desire to look up anymore. Sometimes we need that support of good people, their faith that we borrow, their strength that we borrow, their encouragement that we borrow that allow us to see beyond what we're going through at the time. There's a story of a pilgrim who was walking along a lonely road one day, and he met Jesus on the road. And of all the questions he asked him, he said, Jesus, you know that story where you fed the thousands with a few fish and loaves? At the end of that story, I've always wondered, you said that they should go in there and collect, get baskets and collect up the leftovers, the fragments, you said, so that none would be lost. And so I've always wondered, what exactly is to be gathered up so that nothing would be lost. What is it that would be lost? And Jesus looked at this pilgrim for a long time and he said, the fragments are your fears. And your fears can multiply even faster 
than fishes and loaves. And they will fill so many baskets that it will be too much for you to bear alone. So I'm asking you to bring that stuff to me. It should be brought to me so that nothing in you could be left unfound. And we would bear that together. You know, when the Bible says the words, fear not, it's almost always from a messenger of God or even God himself or Jesus. Fear not. That's a very well-used word in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I don't know if you know this, though. Sometimes we miss this part. Almost always, when God says, fear not, it is coupled with another statement. And the statement happens in different words and paraphrased different ways, but the statement that comes with fear not is usually something like, and lo, I will be with you. Fear not, I will be present in your situation. I will be there. Whatever it is you're struggling with, you're afraid of, whatever you contemplate in the darkness of your heart that scares you and makes you worry, that hurts you and causes you struggle, God wants you to know that He will be there. Now, this is a strange story. Of all the stories in the Bible, probably it's the most strange story that I know of. And it's a story of, you know, of people who at one time who had made a golden calf, and that shouldn't have been done. And so you're sort of thinking, is it sort of a, did they forget and sort of blended those two stories together? I don't know. But the story we have is somebody being instructed, they believe by God, to make a snake out of bronze, which seems to me like an idol. I mean, this is the people who make no graven images. I mean, remember the money changers last week? They were going to a lot of trouble to get images out of the temple, and they got a snake in there. It's sort of crazy. What I think is happening here in this strange story is what God, I believe, does best. He works in context of our fears and our troubles and our struggles and our pains. He works in context always because... When he says fear not, he's also promising presence. And even if you're fearing and you had not got the first part down, he's still with you. And God will work to wring out what can be wrought out of any situation and any struggle and any pain and any hurt that you go through in this life. He will work, as the Bible says, to bring good for those who love him. And so here in this story, in the context of what scares them the most, we see God instructing them to take that fear and make it with their own hands into some image that looks like what scares them the most and lift it up. And the power behind the pole, behind the snake on the pole, is going to be able to lift them up, lift their heads up, and allow them to see that there is something going on more than what they thought they were experiencing with those snakes. In context, people who are fearing the snakes are asked to look and see a snake on the pole, and they'll be saved. Now, years later, and Jesus says it himself in John chapter 3, years later, Jesus himself will be lifted up on a pole. And Jesus is already saying it in John chapter 3 before it ever happens. I want you to remember that story of the snake on the pole in the context because one day in the context of cruelty, in a world where crosses and crucifixion happens, in a world of sinful powers, there will be one who will be lifted up on the pole and he will embody all that cruelty and all that sin and all that cross and crucifixion stuff and in his ugliness and terribleness and in the darkness of that day when even God turned and the darkness and the trembling came even on the cross when Jesus is up there on that pole if you will just look up all those who will look up even though they die yet shall they live God working in the context of us you know that's the way it is it's not usually some lightning bolt, something unique, supernatural from out there that comes into your life. It's usually something that's already in your life and God will use that and somehow creatively in the power and the majesty and the mystery of God work in that situation and bring something good out of it so that even the bad stuff, even the fearful stuff, God can use to power you, strengthen you, encourage you, and even to save you. It's amazing how God works. 
I think one of the greatest fears that we have in our lives is the fear of the future. We can't see that much forward, can we? And we can try to protect ourselves from the future. We have a pact, for example, for our kid to go, one of our kids to go to college. I'm a little scared about that right now. Some of us have tried to protect our retirement by investing in certain things. And some of us have tried to protect our families by having insurance. And some of us have tried to protect ourselves from job reduction by doing whatever they tell us to do and doing the best job that we can with it, even though we shouldn't have to be working those hours or doing those kinds of things because we want to keep our jobs. Some of us are worried about the future of our country. Not only our economy, but the direction of our political spectrum. We're worried about the future of our military and the safety of our people. We worry about a lot of things, and there's a lot of things to be scared of. I think the future is one of them. And the best laid plans we have, no matter what we do, even our best efforts, can still be invaded by some jungle virus that jumped from a monkey to a bushman and spread throughout the whole world and even scares us today. And some of our best laid plans can be handled by the trustees of Bernie Madoff's in this world, and you put it there in good trust, thinking it would protect you in your future. Even that can happen to us. And I'm asking you, in the midst of the fear of the future, to do what the Bible has said all along, and that is to look up. And I'm going to ask you to look further, because you know we can't tell the future, but we can get some of it. Some of it. You can't get all of it. I don't think I can even get next week. But by the miracle of God's revealing something to us, because He loves us so much, He's given us some glimpse. And if you can look far enough ahead to the very end of all things, there's the face of God. And God is smiling, knowing, wonderful, majestic, welcoming, and ready. Because God knows the end of this whole story. And it's going to end so great for everybody. No matter what struggles we went through to get there, or fears that we had to face to get there, or pains that we experienced to get there, the end of that story is going to be marvelous for all of us. This is what Paul says about it. God has made known the mystery of His will according to His good pleasures that He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Him, things in heaven, and things on earth. That's a great bailout package to me. It's amazing grace what God has provided. Listen, today, I'm not going to fool you and say, because you're a follower of Jesus, you won't get bitten. You probably will. Troubles will happen. Fears will happen. And oftentimes, you will need the support of good people to help lift your head to look up. But I am asking you to look up. I'm asking you to look up to Jesus. I'm asking you to look up with the Spirit's help to God. I'm asking you to look up and to trust Him and to believe Him and to know that in the fullness of God's time, all will be made well. All will be okay. And, and I'm asking you even to fear not because of that. Can you allow that glimpse that we get of the ultimate future to infect your presence so that you don't fear? But even if you do fear, Know that God is present. For lo, He is with us in all situations that we face, in every fear, in every struggle, and in every situation. Look up. Look up. And your salvation, the salvation from God, is waiting right there for you to see. I'm asking you to trust Him. In Jesus' name, amen. have a moment for us to respond as an invitation. And today I'd like for you to think about the things that you fear. I'd like, to think about, I'd like for you to think about where you're looking. I've invited you to look up, to see God, to trust Him, and to put your faith in Him with not just your salvation, but the salvation of the abundant life that He wants to give you every day, the salvation of knowing that whatever you face, He's with you, the salvation of knowing that He's there to work and bring good out of whatever you're facing. I'm asking you to try to see those things through the eyes of faith, to trust that He's with us and He's watching over us. And today as you respond, you may want to talk to God about that. You may want to come forward and pray this morning because you've got fears in your heart, troubles and things that bother you. 
and you need people to lift you up. And as you come and pray, you're praying to God. There will be all these folks here who will see that, and they will be lifting you up as well. I invite you to do that if you want to. There are others who have decisions that they want to make. They're deciding maybe I want to finally join this church and be a part of what you're doing. Or I want to join Jesus. I want to be a Christian because I trust Him and I believe in Him. I'm going to ask you to do those things today. Make that courageous step this morning. Listen to what God has to say to you and look up as we stand and sing today. 463. 463. Precious Lord, take my hand. Today, I do want to remind you about tonight, uh, about our worship service around our first core value. I hope that you'll all come and be a part of that and hear that. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Chrissy, if she would, to share about the blood drive that's coming up at our church. So let you do that, and then we'll have our benediction, okay? Thank you. It's a good thing we're talking about fear today, since we're having a blood drive coming up. <laughs> I know everybody's scared, but don't be. And with the economy, this is something you can do for free, and you get so much in return. You save people's lives. Um, you know, Megan Britton, she's had 38 units of blood and 15 units of platelets. And that right there, you have 8 to 10 pints in your body. So you know what? That's a lot of times that she could have had a lot worse. And bless her heart, she, they've just had the rough time, and she's been so sick. But just to put it in perspective, 38 units of blood, and that's just amazing. And, you know, you can help with that. Um, She's about to go in and get some more treatments done, and she will have to have more. So just think about that. It's going to be April 2nd from 11 to 4, and we're looking for 22 units. And I know, look at all these people. We can get 22 units. I know we can, and it just takes a little bit of time, and we really appreciate it. And just know that it is going to a good cause. High schools are about to get out. That's 20% of the blood that we collect. So we're about to, you know, have a drought going into the summer season. That's when you'll see me outside Walmart with my please give blood sign. <laughs> so please come out to the blood drive on April 2nd. And also in the bulletin you saw about the marriage retreat. That is going to be very exciting, uh, May 1st and 2nd. So make sure you mark your calendars for that. We've, we've uh, met about that last week, and that's going to be something really great for our married couples to start up. Thanks. He got the whole world. In his hands he got the whole world. In his hands he got the whole world. In his hands he got you and me, brother. In his hands he got you and me, sister. In his hands he got you and me, brother. In his hands he got the whole world. In his hands he got the whole. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a great day. See you back tonight.